Hi guys, so here we are for the third video of the uh, Life in Budo uh, series with uh, Leandro, who is a quite interesting man with a long um, and, and very rich uh, experience uh, of Budo and uh, Kobudo Koryu in Japan. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming today all the way uh, to our small studio. Um, very happy to have you here. And I hope that uh, your stories and your views of Budo will uh, inspire uh, other Budoka, uh, long-term Budoka or beginners, no matter um, the experience people have. I think um, there are some people who um, need inspiration, uh, like your story, actually. Uh, I can say that because I was quite inspired by uh, the few stories I've read uh, from you or about you. So, uh, thank you very much. No, it's an honor, a pleasure. Thank you very much for receiving me here today, Jordi. And uh, I think we are united by the same feeling, by the same light. And I hope we have a very nice and productive conversation today. So, let's start with the presentation. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Um, where you come from, uh, what Budo you practice, how long you've been in Japan, why you came to Japan. Uh, Succinct, short, short introduction, and then I will ask more questions uh, about each point so okay. we can go into details. <clears throat> well, my name is Leandro Dias Napolitano. I was born in Brazil. I have just turned my 40 years old and I have been living in Japan since 2015. And due to my work at the Brazilian Foreign Service, I work at the Brazilian Embassy here in Tokyo. And I have been practicing Budo for more than 20 years now. And the, the rest will be a story for us to talk during the, this conversation. Okay. Um, so you came to Japan uh, for your work, primarily. But you were practicing Budo before, so you were um, already working on uh, Japanese culture or events or stuff like that when you were uh, in Brazil? Well, uh, not really. Uh, I have uh, my first uh, uh, contact with Budo was Kyokushin Karate um, by the age of 10, 12 years old. And uh, after a long period uh, of break, I have practiced maybe two years, about two years of Kyokushin Karate. And uh, after a, a long break, uh, I was in a moment of my life that uh, I, was, I was needing some, some framework to support my, my activities. That at that moment I was um, in the middle of law school in Brazil. And after a, a moment of uh, enlightenment in one trip, I realized that um, I had uh, something that my, my working destination was something related to international relations. And at that moment, um, I realized that uh, I wanted to work at the Brazilian Foreign Office, Foreign Service. That's when I started studying for the tests to enter the, the Brazilian Foreign, Foreign Service. And well, as it happens in, in all public service, uh, the public tests are very, very competitive and very, very complicated. So at that moment, I was needing something to, to give me a, a mental, spiritual uh, and the body support to, to help me through, mm -hmm. through 10, 14 hours of studies. And at the time, I was living in Achibaya, uh, a small city close to Sao Paulo. And at that moment, uh, the, the Budo that I found that was closer to what I was needing was Aikido. And that's how my, my journey on Budo restarts. After a long blank, when I stopped Kyokushin Karate, which also was a, a very profound moment where I, I had contact with so many great people and I, I those people had left in, in my, my spirit uh, the true soul of Budo. So I had a great sensei and my partners were awesome. 
So as you know, I was born with a disability. I was born with a, a malformation of the right leg below the knee. And I didn't care much about that, thanks to my parents, how the way they, they raised me. Uh, it wasn't really a problem to me. So instead of they bring me what I wanted, I should go there and pick it up for myself. So there was no easy time with them. I was always pushed, so my limits were always being challenged. And thanks to that, um, I always could do whatever I wanted. Any kind of experience from extreme experience, like radical stuff, like diving, uh, air, air stuff, no matter the terrain, I would go and do it, right? So at the moment when I was 10, 12 years old, Kyokushin was very hard. I, I couldn't blame my leg. I, I didn't realize that. It was hard because Kyokushin is hard any, any time of your yeah, life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kyokushin is hard. Yeah, yeah. So since I would take people to run outside, uh, to run out on the city, and you know, that pain that start having here in the belly when you're very young, I couldn't end the leg already, taking too much to me. So I had this very nice colleague. He should be around his 20s. Unfortunately, he's not here with us anymore, but uh, I still keep these moments in my heart. And I'm a very good friend of his brother too. And he would say, hey, no way you're going to stop. Come here. And he would pick me up and put on his back and boom, 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 boom. You know, that kind of community spirit, not give up, left a, a, a super nice impression on me. And somehow, uh, when the time came that I needed to knock on the doors of Budo again, I could find that on Aikido and much more. So the story is, uh, I started Aikido in 2001, in the, when I was right on the start of my studies for the foreign service. And after one year, I was lucky to pass on my first text, test to the, the entry of the Brazilian foreign service. And after one year, I was moving to Brasilia uh, to, to work in the headquarters. And there, I, I kept studying Aikido uh, with the group I still very much in touch and they are the, the, the place where I graduated, I, I received my, my shodan and a group with, with which I share so many beautiful stories, uh, especially with our Shihang at the time, Mestre Martins, who has a, a beautiful uh, a story related to the beginning of Aikido in Brazil as well. So I owe too much that group uh, regarding my Aikido formation. And after 10 years uh, in Brasilia, and um, I realized that uh, I remembered that inside my heart I had a, a a desire to learn Kyudo. Because the moment when I found Aikido in Ichibaya, it was a, a moment where, firstly, I was moved after reading a Kyudo book wrote by Eugen Herio. Of course. <laughs> Which one? The Kyudo book. The Kyudo book, the, the romantic, romantic Kyudo book, where most of Westerns fall in love by Aikido in a first reading because it's very seductive. <laughs> yeah, yeah it is. I don't know um, if it was intended to be seductive, but it's uh, yeah, it's the classic for, for all Budoka, I think. Yes, yes, I think so. And um, unfortunately, at the beginning of the years 2000, we didn't have Kyudo in Brazil at all. Uh, Kyudo is a very, very recent a path in Brazil that uh, uh, has started somehow around 2008, which has a, which is a, a, another beautiful story as well. So, uh, having had waited to practice Kyudo for 10 years, somehow I remembered in the bottom of my heart that, oh, the feeling about Kyudo, I really wanted to practice 
maybe somehow it exists already in Brazil. Let's check it out on Google. Pa, 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 pa. There was a group just initiated in Brasilia. They started back in 2010. The year was 2011 and I entered in contact with that group. Uh, that's the Brasilia Kyudokai. Uh, Kyudokai DF, Kyudokai of the federal district. And this is how uh, I started my journey on Kyudo as well. So you asked me about my, my work, if somehow it was related to Japan. Uh, not at all. My, my contact with the uh, uh, Japanese uh, um, uh, culture comes mostly from Budo, but back in Atibaya, in Atibaya, the city where uh, I grew up, Atibaya is a, a, a city uh, um, in the countryside of Sao Paulo, which uh, received many, many, uh, um, received the first Japanese who went to Brazil in the beginning of the 20th century. The massive uh, Japanese immigration in Brazil. That's right. So the, the first Japanese immigrants went to Brazil in 1908. They departed from Kobe uh, uh, port, harbor, in the Kasatomaru. That was the first ship that took the first Japanese immigrants to Brazil. So it was a very delicate moment in Japan at the time. Uh, the economy had serious problems. The population was really uh, 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 high. And Japan started to promote the immigration to few countries. And Brazil, luckily, was one of the destinations that the Japanese government chose for uh, uh, the first Japanese find a new destination, a new life. And the, the city of Achibaya itself uh, um, has received a lot from the Japanese agriculture techniques. And nowadays our city is responsible for a large part of the, the flowers and the fruits produ produced not only in Sao Paulo, but in Brazil. So with Japanese um, culture and technological background, you mean? Mostly with the Japanese technolo te technology and background, the, the Brazilian agriculture evolved uh, enormously. So the soy production that we are a world, uh, uh, we have the, the world record in volume production of soy. Uh, soy is a product that naturally, environmentally needs colder environments, but uh, after a program between the Brazilian and the Japanese government and the top technology developed between the, the two countries, it was possible to uh, harvest, to plant and harvest soybeans in, in hotter areas in the central of Brazil. So that's how Brazil became one of the largest producers of soybeans in the world. Which is essential for the Japanese cuisine. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, how did you manage to come to Japan? I mean, you applied for a program within the, your, your work organization, so you could come to uh, the Japanese embassy? Yes. Uh, so, after entering the, the Brazilian Foreign Service, it took me a while to be assigned to a permanent mission abroad. That's because I used to work uh, at the trade promotion and investment section in a moment that the former Brazilian president uh, had put a lot of importance and was uh, uh, making a lot of uh, um, international and business trip abroad in order to strengthen the trade influx between the countries. So for Almost 13 years, I had the chance to work closely organizing these international trips for the Brazilian president and the, the Brazilian businessmen, where they would make ways to promote the international trade between our countries. So because of that, I stayed a lot. Usually people entering the foreign service and in their third or fourth year, they already take some assignment to any 
an international post. Uh, so the posts could be either embassies, uh, consulates, missions on international organizations. And, but in my case, it took me a while because of that uh, opportunity. So due to that, I was already training Aikido. Mm -hmm. And always during these trips, I could find some time between the intervals to enter, to reach the local Aikido association. And luckily, I had the chance to train in Libya. I had the chance to train in Morocco. I had the chance to train in Panama. I had the chance to train in Iran. And uh, like after almost 20 years and now practicing at Hombo Dojo, sometimes I have the, the great pleasure to meet the people I, I had the privilege to, to train back in their countries. And it's always uh, such a lovely surprise because some of them moved to Japan. Some came back to Japan that were Japanese uh, teaching outside. And that feeling of community is so beautiful. It's so, it's really a, a privilege to be among these people. You quoted um, countries in which the situation is difficult or uh, in which the Aikido community is quite small. Um, don't you have the feeling that um, when the, the, the community reaches a certain size, the relationships are a bit more difficult between different groups. I mean, we can see uh, France, for example, in which you, there are two official federations that are both more or less uh, affiliated with the, the Aikikai and International Federation. People have some difficulties to communicate <laughs> between these two, two groups. But I have the feeling, <clears throat> uh, because what, what you said uh, made me uh, uh, think about that, the, when you see people from Iran, from, uh, uh, I mean, even from uh, North African countries, uh, also from um, a country with a difficult history like Libya as well, um, coming to the Humpu Dojo, you feel that the, the, their sense of community and um, uh, mutual assistance um, is stronger. And I was wondering with all your travels uh, if you notice this specificities in, in the communities. Yes, uh, I believe after having made those visits and creating, having created those bounds with these colleagues, I could see that the, the objectives of Osense with Shiba in creating a golden bridge between people is a reality. So I, I really believe that creating bridges instead of walls is the best way to bring everyone together towards the same light. So the path is perfect in itself. We are not. <laughs> but that's why we are in the path. We are in this process of making a self as closer as possible as the perfection postulated by the path, which also is a virtual reality. We know that the path in itself only can be perfect if it evolves with time. Otherwise, it would be extinguished how many, with many other paths. But the, the virtue, the virtue that the, the path proposes is the virtue, the kind of virtue that can only be created by building bridges and not walls. And I, I think that's the, the good part of the Buddha that we, uh, we want to, to preserve. I have heard a story from a close friend that she went to um, Doshu once, tell him, I'm tired, something like that. I'm tired of the, the, the people are fighting, people are criticizing. Sometimes it's 
heavy. And he said, uh, they are humans. There is no, no better answer. I mean, the, the, what he meant is they're probably trying, but they also have the right to fail. So I think that was a very, very good answer. Uh, made me think of that, yeah. Uh, and, well, I have to admit that uh, the more the people have the experience of a tough life, um, the more um, likely they are to um, want to create bridges with others, I think. And I, I would say that the reason is uh, when you've had a hard time yourself, uh, you know that um, you might need people in the future to help you. And there is no better way to uh, ensure that you have a community to support you than be part of the community and support others. That sounds obvious, but it's actually not obvious if you look at the world. <laughs> so, and working in the international uh, relation, uh, how, how do you um, promote this idea of uh, communities, of building bridges, to people not practicing Budo? I mean, even in Japan, we know that uh, a minority of Japanese people are practicing Budo, and even among them, most of them who practice Judo or Kendo have not that really much knowledge of what Budo is, They're more practicing like a sport. So it, it makes actually the number of people in Japan understanding this, the meaning of Budo quite small. And be it Japanese or, or Brazilian, so whatever nationality, how do you push this idea uh, into the mind and make it uh, something real for them too? I think we are ourselves, uh, we are the only promoters of Budo. I mean, the, the things we do on the path, the way we train, the, the principles we try to preserve and we share, that's uh, what reflects the, the kind of, of Budo that we want, right? So here in Seido, you guys are doing an amazing, beautiful job preserving Budo culture and the hard work of the craftsmen in Japan. And we are all, all every Budo, Budoka in the world uh, somehow is benefiting from that. So the way Seido promotes Budo, the way Leandro promotes Budo is the way people see Budo, right? So in my case, Budo uh, has changed my life. Uh, in a way that empowered me as a person with disability. So people with disability uh, naturally have natural uh, uh, challenges that not always, it's not so clear for them that can be overcome. Okay, so for me, uh, uh, Budo uh, uh, is also a framework that support uh, uh, the the possibility to achieve all goals, all desires that I had in my life, like I said in the beginning. So truly, when uh, I try to create bridges um, by Budo, uh, I try to uh, to promote a more diverse environment inside Budo. We know that although Budo is a very very traditional uh, environment. And the, the level of traditional differs from dojo to dojo, from modality to modality. And what is traditional in one dojo, in another dojo, people really don't care much. So it's very, very complicated. It's very complicated. We're also talking about uh, <coughs> inclusions of women, inclusion of foreigners and stuff like that. Yes. Um, all kind of, uh, it's uh, inclusion of diversity. All right, so one of the, the models that um, the, the, the local Olympic committee tries to promote is unity in diversity. As you know, Japan has already a full uh, a set of infrastructure, infrastructure for the Olympics that was made already in 64. They really didn't need anything new, <laughs> but 
that's from the engineering point of view. But on the human point of view, to bring diversity to, so, to societies is still a challenge. And in the traditional communities such as Budo, this is also a, a real struggle. So this is my bridge. This is the, the way I try to promote Budo, showing that the way Budo has empowered me, it can empower other people with disability. So Budo gave me the support needed to nurture my soul, my life. Without Budo, I wouldn't know how the present Leandro would be. So picture yourself, years, the years that have passed since you had started in the path, and how would be Georgi now? I see what you mean. I mean, I asked this question to Christian Tissi a, a few years ago, and he told me, I have no idea what I would be with a Daikido because I am someone with Aikido, so I cannot tell you what never happened. <laughs> and the delta was, again, just perfect. It's very hard to, to, to distinguish what is Budo in you and what is not. It's kind of one thing. It's one symbiotic relation, and you, I cannot see myself without uh, practicing Budo. And when people ask me, what is your favorite Budo? Because I practice Aikido, I practice Kyudo, I do Koryu Bojitsu. I cannot answer. It's impossible. It's impossible because they all are complementary in their, in their selves. And the skills that I take from one, I can use in another. And that, rea that relation creates a new Leandro every day. So the way that Budo has empowered me, I want to see other people with disabilities having the same chances that I did. But for that to happen, we need more people with, disabili with disabilities training. But we have the, the inclusion and the accessibility question, right? So it is beautiful to see someone with a disability uh, struggle on the stairs of a dojo to go to the training without couldn't be able to walk. But it would be even more beautiful to see much more people with the same disability having the chance to train together without having to crawl the stairs up to dojo. So I really, I really believe that the, the qualities that one sees in the struggle of an individual with disability that has overcome the, the challenges, the physical challenges, should be faced as a chance to think about including other people. Well, it is uh, somewhat the same idea as um, having more women promoted to high rank because it will be uh, a symbol uh, and uh, a motive and inspiration for the women to try to achieve the same thing. But all in all, we still end up with um, um, facing walls of people that are um, pulling back on those uh, changes. And I was wondering if your approach, your approach seems to be uh, very um, uh, straightforward toward um, practitioners. Like, see, I can do it, you can do it. Uh, what, do, do you think about what you can do or do you do uh, actually, do things actually, on the backstage to, uh, well, I don't want to say force people to accept because you cannot force people to accept. Maybe educate people to understand the difference. Um, I, I can imagine that in your job, uh, this is also something you have to do, educate people to understand what actually, for example, uh, 
educate the Japanese on the Brazilian culture so they can understand what the Brazilians are asking and vice versa, of course. But what's on the backstage? Well, uh, that's a, a very good question because to me, it happens naturally. I'm not a pro-activist. I don't defend any political point of view. I don't try to force people to have that idea. As you said, I try to be the promoter by myself, showing that I can do it. And here and there, if somehow I have the chance to make, a, uh, to educate people like, oh, he's a disabled. No, he's a person with disability. Okay, so that these are small changes in in our vocabulary that helps grow uh, to grow a new uh, way of think, a new mindset. So since the the years two thousand, especially with the signature of the the UN Convention for the Rights of People with Disability. A lot of has been evolved in the inclusion and the accessibility world scenario. Like, for instance, in Brazil, we have a, a much more a, 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 we are much more easier to to work in a um, in a diverse environment with different uh, alterities like. A, a, we are a, a, a very mixed country since the beginning. In Brazil, all kinds of nationalities find a fertile terrain to regrow their lives. It happened with the Portuguese, with the whole story with African people, then the uh, Middle East people, Europeans, recently, more recently, 80, uh, people from Haiti, and another influx from Africa, Pakistan, and somehow... And Japanese, of course. Well, Japanese, of course, in the beginning of the 20th. And, well, just for the records, Japanese are uh, the, the Nikkeiji in Brazil. They are uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, they are already in the fourth generation. And Brazil is considered the largest Japanese country outside Japan. Yeah. So their influence in our culture... Um, with all these other cultures, it's a huge influence. And Brazil is, uh, is always changing due to that. So uh, about the, the, this um, accessibility in Japan, because I think it's a very interesting topic. We have, um, you, you were saying about uh, the, the fact that Brazilians are uh, used to work uh, in communities, different people. Uh, uh, so open to differences and I think it's kind of the same uh, not the same but it's the same logic uh, in, in, in some European countries the United States not so much recently but at the beginning or, uh, or France which is a very diverse country and I see that um, if in France we're not shocked by someone uh, who is uh, missing a leg or an arm I mean Oh, poor guy, but you know, he, he make his life, you know, it's just no luck. And, and then we continue away. Japanese people are not like, <gasps> what do you do? Should I help him? I should, uh, and I couldn't work with such people because it would be such a stress every day. And the, it fills their mind and it kind of become crazy about because of the difference. But they have escalators. Um, they have the Tenji blocks, the, the, the uh, <coughs> yellow blocks in yes. the streets everywhere. Uh, if you want to go on a train, you can call in advance. They're going to put you in the train with your wheelchair. And I mean, it hasn't always been perfect, but especially with the, the lots of, of improvements they did for the, the Olympics, Tokyo is probably the most accessible city in the world. And it's impressive to see the, the, the effort they made to, to, to do that. Yet, people and the society as a whole <clears throat> has a, a huge, huge troubles to accept uh, diversity. And uh, 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 it's kind of the opposite as the logic we have 
uh, uh, in the West or uh, in Brazil, I think. I mean, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. So while in Brazil and Europe, Europe, we have this closer relation to inclusion. In Brazil, we lack accessibility. We are struggling, we have accessibility engineering in many places, but it's still something to work. While in Japan, accessibility is always, almost perfect in the big centers, yeah. like yeah. in the countryside, it's still a challenge. But the, the, the biggest challenge is with the inclusion. So people to understand uh, ways to bring everyone together, that's the, the, the big step they still need to do. One, one, one story that happened to me. So I was with my, my, my dad and my brother were visit, visiting me in 2017, and we were at the, the Tokyo tree, the, the sky, sky tree, tree, the sky yeah. tree. And always huge lines. And unfortunately, I, I can't stand for longer periods. So for me, 15 minutes would be already too painful. So this is why I need to use the, the preference line. So I go to the, the lady and I ask, there was no sign indication for the, 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 the preference line for people with disability. So I asked the, the, the staff, uh, do you have any, any line for people with disability? Ah, oh, we do. Do you have the, the Shogasha Techo? And I said, no, because uh, I'm a diplomatic officer and we don't have it. Ah, sorry, you cannot use that. Which is, yeah, Japan. So it's something of the, that comes from the excessive bureaucratic system, the income system <laughs> with, um, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's like, is there, the service is there, the society is there, uh, wealth is there, go and get it, it's okay. But they are not interested in giving that push needed for minorities or, or people that are historically challenged somehow in order to reach. So once we have representativity that starts with one, but that one shows that it's possible and comes another one and another one, yeah. then the big movement might happen. And I hope, I really hope that the, the Olympics and the Paralympic Games happen in a very um, uh, healthy and, and fraternal spirit in the next year in order to promote that changes because a country so rich culturally and educationally. I believe that Japan has one of the most educated societies in the world. Like if you have that, that super high education uh, uh, mult mul multiplied along all nationalities living in Japan, not in a way to assimilate or, or impose the Japanese culture, but it's beautiful whenever you see Omotenashi. And I came to Japan for the first time in 2014, uh, one year before my assignment. And by the moment I entered the, the, the airplane to go back to Brazil, I was crying because uh, I had found a, a hidden pearl that I have been looking for all my life and it was such a, a, a fast jump because at the time I came to Japan to, to take a Kyudo seminar and I did some, some tourism, I visited the Hombu Dojo, luckily I had the chance to meet um, Leonardo and Igor, they were training at the Hombu Dojo at the time, who introduced me to many other friends, and boom, I was totally enlightened by the, the Budo spirit. Until that moment, I was training Budo, Aikido, Kyudo, but after that time in Japan, 
I became Buddha. And that's how Buddha now is part of my Ikigai. I, well, it's my feeling, but I have this feeling that um, the community, um, <clears throat> the Budo community in Japan is really fueled, um, um, is positively fueled in, in the foreigner community. I mean, the fact that we are foreigners in Japan um, kind of forces us to actually be a, a, a community within the Budo community. Um, and it makes things much easier, uh, much uh, more um, um, it creates a, a, an environment that is um, more prone to learn properly Budo, I think. Uh, in the sense that most Japanese practicing Budo, they are vaguely in a community, the Budo community, but they have their job, their university, and they're coming to the dojo, but the dojo is not a very strong community in, in itself. In Budo, in Koryu, I think it's a bit different, but especially the Ombu Dojo, well, the community is quite light, who, who can I say that? Very, not superficial, but not very strong. But foreigners, the, the, the way people can find an apartment, a place to live, uh, uh, cheap restaurants, uh, when you're running in a very uh, uh, low payroll, which is often the case of many foreigners coming to train here. And most of the foreigners uh, coming to train, well, when they take one month or two months off to train in Japan, they don't have much money to spend, that they're living in very uh, uh, low budget. And I think it creates something that unfortunately maybe Japanese don't have, or fortunately we have, uh, that makes things a little more, um, um, maybe like it was after the war in the, the 50s in Japan, you know, more um, Budo is something that binds me to other people, not just something I do on the weekend. Uh, but I have this feeling that it's stronger among the, the foreign community than the, the Japanese. Yes, I, I think that is a, a right way to think the, the situation. Like, remember your time back in France, how was your relation to the French culture? Yes. So, being Brazilian, I see that foreigners are much more interested in our, in our culture many times than ourselves. And I see that for capoeira, for instance, and, and other uh, uh, traditional uh, folklore. Um, here in Japan, our common interest uh, has created uh, this very uh, strong network and we owe, especially Don Drager, <laughs> yeah. back then. <laughs> he's, he's the, the father of the fathers. Been, we might not have been here without him. Yes, absolutely. And like, I remember before coming to Japan, taking Japanese lessons in Brazil, and my, my Japanese uh, uh, sensei, he was a Brazilian who has lived in Japan for 16 years, has studied in the Tsukuba Daigaku, and he has like JLPT1, the guy is a super master, is also involved in, in, in traditional culture like us. And But I remember he's, he, he, he's saying that I was super excited. No, I'm going to be in Japan. I'm going to study this and that. Mom, mom, mom. Hey, and then he said, he, he, he threw me a... Uh, ice bucket. He said, hey, hey, take it easy, man. Japan is not that easy. It's not easy to, to find all these things that you're mentioning. He, and I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take your advice. But then I arrived in Japan and finally I arrived in, in July 
Finally, in October, I had the chance to, to go to the Kashima Enbu. And the only thing I didn't do in Japan the first time I visited in 2014 was to, to attend a Koryu Enbu Taikai. I think that was the reason I was crying the plane. <laughs> 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 but at that moment, when I came back to Japan, um, I had uh, the contact uh, of a, a nice guy who was working on the promotion of Koryu Bujitsu. And he said, well, there will be the Kashima Enbu, let's go there. Then I go there, he introduced me to Michael and other practitioners. And after that, I made so many Taikens and Kengakus in different Koryu schools until I have decided to uh, uh, enroll on the Katori Shintoryu classes. That the, the network was here. And, and people were so willing to share, so happy. Although some of the schools were kind of refractory. <laughs> that's kind of incredible, you know. Um, if you forget about the foreigners, then take only the Japanese. When you do Aikido, you do Aikido, you don't do Judo or Kendo or, or even less Koryu. You just do, you do Aikido. Maybe in some rare cases you do a bit of Daitoryu because it's linked to Aikido, if you have the chance to have like a teacher or someone with those Daito. And that's it. And if you're doing Katori Shintoryu, you're not doing uh, Bojutsu or whatever, you're doing Katori. You're doing the Bojutsu within the Katori, but you're not doing another Koryu. And katori is too big in itself to, to do something else, like what Japanese people would say. And I don't say no, Japanese never did that. Many did. But it's not something very normal for them. And many teachers tend to discourage their students to go somewhere else. But with us, it's like, yeah, I do Aikido and I do a bit of EI and I do Kendo and I did, did Judo as well. And actually, I'm considering taking karate classes, you know. And people are like, what do you do? Um, I mean, one of the examples I have is I, I'm considering taking karate next year. Uh, I like to do Goju-ryu. And some people told me, what? Isn't Aikido enough? Uh, your Aikido isn't working. But, I mean, no, <coughs> it, it's just, I want to do, I don't know why. <laughs> you know, it, it's, I'm lucky because my Aikido teachers didn't even discourage me to do karate they say well whatever <laughs> whatever you want but it's the umbu dojo they're not like that uh, smaller dojo might be different and, and this way of um, navigating through various budo actually seeing budo as a wall uh, many people take, tell me when you say budo you say uh, aikido or, or koryu no everything budo it is just a it doesn't really mean anything in itself. Uh, of course, Aikido and Katori is, is not the same thing. But in our um, foreign Budo community, we're all friends, we're all together. And we find this, uh, this way of, of talking, sharing ideas. And I feel that we're all going on the same path, you know. Um, um, against discriminations, uh, for inclusions of people with disability, for women, of foreigners, whatever. We all agree with that. All Japanese, I don't know, but all foreigners agree with, with that. Almost all. If you disagree, uh, maybe put a comment. Uh, that would be fun. Uh, no, I mean, this, uh, the, this image we have as foreigners of Budo, don't you think that it's actually not the image that Japanese people have of Budo? That we made it all, all on uh, Budo. We have our own definition, actually. Yes, and, and we go back uh, to the, the point of being a native in the country and not be able to, to have a broader image. Like, we, are, we have a tubular vision on the local thing, and we cannot see the, the importance and how the, the systemic importance of the thing. So 
many times when I'm talking to Japanese people and they talk, ah, bodo ne, nanto ka ya demas ne, eto, shumi ne, shumi desu ka? So, it, I think it's a different concept. Uh, it's just, shumi means uh, hobby. Hobby. Yeah. So, facing budo as a hobby, is it possible? No problem. You go there, you train something with not much of a, a, a depth, and you don't think about it, you train twice a week or even every day. People do that as a shumi as well, no problem. But f for me, for you and, and, and this network, and obviously for some Japanese as well, of course, of course. Uh, uh, I try to run away from all kind of generalizations. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> I'm overgeneralizing uh, to make a point, but of course, uh, it's, there are foreigners that think different and there are Japanese who think exactly like we do and all the, the variations in between, of course. But the fact is, if you don't face Budo as a, a, a style, way of living, it might not promote the changes that the, the path, the objectives of the path has. To, to of self-development, to find virtue inside oneself. And that's why I'm on that. Well, uh, uh, a short story. Uh, and then if you can try to find your own short story, work, work story. Um, I often find difficult to talk with some people from some customers um, at work when they're telling me, um, this is wrong, you should do that. And I say, no, we actually did nothing wrong. And indeed, there was a problem that is not our fault. That is our responsibility, but not our fault. So please keep your um, emails respectful because you know I'm not disrespecting you, so please don't disrespect me. At, at this point, of course, we're going to solve the problem but let's be respectful. And what I hear back is, how the hell dare are you talking to me like that? I'm the customer, I'm right. No, you're not. I'm sorry, but you're not. Um, if you're not right, means you're wrong. And I'm gonna tell you, you're wrong. Because even in, in my line of work, in my work, uh, I don't, I, of course, I care about business. It's important to do good business, but not over dishonesty and disrespect. Uh, I'm not going to lie to someone to make him happy to make more money. And that's something that many, many, many people have very hard time to understand because there is this way that in the modern society, um, the customer is king, the business is... Um, I want to say sh nothing. They have to shut up and, and say yes to everything, like Amazon does. I mean, you complain to Amazon, yes, you're right, but they refund you. That's they refund you and they take the money from the merchant, of course, because it's not Amazon paying. You know, it's easy to make such decisions when you're not paying for it. And the world is spoiled. And I think one of the responsibility of Budo, or at least in my work, what the part of budo I can bring in my work is honesty. Doesn't mean that I'm not taking responsibility. It means that I'm talking with honesty. Some people are really uh, open to that kind of uh, of communication. Some people don't. And I mean, it's okay. You can go elsewhere. You don't have to talk to me. So it's, it's, it's okay. But I think it's a way to show some form of example and maybe some people could be inspired by this way of doing things. And step by step, the society can move toward more honesty between people and maybe um, weaken this uh, quite toxic uh, business customer relationship, I think, that uh, companies like Amazon created. Though it's me, one guy, for the 
not only me, but I mean, I'm not going to change the world. Uh, and, but as you said, we live through Budo, so when we do the work the, the, the at home with our kids, with education, with everything, we just act not exactly according to the, the, the some Budo Bible that just doesn't exist, but by our own um, interpretation of Budo. I realized that uh, uh, talking with people at work, step by step, you know, so why, why am I doing things this way? I think it's an example, uh, in my case, of what you, you, you were saying. Uh, and I'd like to have an example of, of yours at, at work. Well, one thing that uh, I have learned is that there is a right time for ideas to flourish. Like, um, by 2014, in the in the Brazilian Foreign Service, uh, we had the chance to to found uh, a group to discuss and promote the rights of the civil servants with disabilities and their uh, relatives, dependents with disabilities. Okay, so either the, the, the people, the, the civil servants with disabilities and the, the dependents of the, that civil servant who has uh, any kind of disability, they are uh, uh, under a frame, a legal frame of rights that should be preserved in order to allow that person to have their normal activities. Okay. So there is like a, a quota of 5% of the, the vacancies destined to people with disabilities that are, uh, that are like um, uh, rights for uh, uh, a companions on, on, on travels, business travels, work travels. Uh, and during a long time, it wasn't that easy to, to make those rights uh, uh, effective and by that time we had a chance after uniting a, a group towards the same objective we had the chance to to found that uh, a committee and that's one example of how breathing understanding that is not the time for that but uh, keep working locally thinking globally <laughs> somehow Eventually, things will work. Obviously, it's different in the customer service, like you are dealing directly with the customer. And especially here with the Omotenashi culture that the, the client uh, is like Kamisama. It's, uh, there are some uh, yeah. <laughs> difference depending on the, on the person. But... Uh, I believe that uh, that's one way. So to breathe and understand the systemic uh, uh, way how things are working. And uh, um, more recently, like a, a, like a customer case, sometimes people come to the embassy and, and they feel that the embassy is obligated to help them whatever are their demands. Mm. So no is no. There are rules <laughs> and there is not much we can do. And we hate to say Shogunai, <laughs> that's not the way it is. We are, uh, we understand your situation, but there is no way that this demand can be uh, filled, fulfilled now. It doesn't make sense either by the, the legal point of view or somehow uh, uh, it will be against uh, uh, the, the, the political or the, the, the international principles of, uh, of the, the, the country. So there are many, there are similar cases such as yours. And unfortunately, no is no 
and there's nothing much we can do. But going back to the 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 way Kudo uh, Budo has empowered me and is a path that can help people grow. I think uh, like I'm not talking about big dojos like Kodokan or Hombu Dojo where people end up losing track of the traditional aspects. But in a dojo, we have a, a prototype of a whole environment. So we enter from the lower place, we bow to the highest place, we have the social relations, we have the dojo manager, uh, we have to deal with many kinds of sentiments, emotions, and although people many times don't realize how important it is, it might end up uh, uh, changing the way, uh, evolving the way people relate in society. Mm -hmm. Let, let's try, uh, um, technically speaking, how, how you connect uh, uh, philosophy and technique. So we're not going to talk specific Aikido technique, whatever, because it would be too technical. But um, uh, broadly, uh, for example, um, well, Aikido is based on two people um, practicing with each other, uh, which is the case of most martial arts, not Kudo, but most of the others. And, uh, well, Judo is uh, one against one and karate a little bit too but Aikido is more like we are in collaboration um, that being said let's uh, take an example you attack someone you have to attack with as much honesty as possible uh, it's probably the same in Koryu as um, your goal is not to really hit the guy, it's to allow him to do the kata. Uh, same thing in Aikido, it's a kata geiko, you're, you're giving something so the other can do the kata. In judo, of course, you're going to attack honestly because your goal is to win. But uh, let, let's take the, the example of Aikido, which I think can translate to most kata geiko in, uh, in Koryu. Uh, you will tell me if, I, if you think I'm wrong, of course. Um, so you have to attack with much honesty. So here there is a, 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 a technical uh, point that you can translate, I think, in the, the Buddha philosophy and in the everyday life. When you are in a collaborative environment, work, for example, um, with colleagues, and you have to give your colleague something so he can move forward, which level of... Um, self-investment you are going to put in what you're doing to help your colleague and why you do it. I think that's something you can actually work on on the mat. Yes, absolutely. Um, inside the, the institution of the work environment, whenever dealing with colleagues, I think there is no better way to do it by open, freely speaking, but in a gentle way. I think um, being gentle is the only way you can have a real response from your colleague, from your partner, in Keiko, no matter what dimension of your life, okay? Obviously, we all have different emotions along the day, but uh, there is always a spark I think we train for that. We train to understand the the moment when someone comes to you and hits you and say, don't do that. Either you get up injured or you are going to injure someone. If you want a good result from that, take it easy. Breathe. Be under control. If you want to put all your anger towards your partner, your work colleague, you can do it, but you need to be ready for a bad response. You need to be ready with the consequence of hurting him or her. Are you willing to that? 
I am not. I am not. So I prefer 1,000 times get hurt than to hurt. Sometimes it's impossible. Yeah, and you have the situation in which there is a vertical relationship and you know, when it's horizontal with a colleague, it's easy. You can say, okay, he has no more responsibility, no less than me, we're equal, calm down, let's communicate. When you are someone above you or under you and what he does will affect you and then there is someone above. That makes really the, the relation difficult. But as you said, I, I really agree with that. The dojo is an environment in which you have everything. You have colleagues at the same level. You have vertical relationship. You have everything. And I, you can tell me if you agree with that or not. But in the West, especially in Europe, I think, maybe in the US also, um, there is a movement, there is a tendency to transform, to change uh, Budo, not Koryu, of course, but modern Budo, into um, a friendly environment in which everyone is equal. The teacher is not above, the teacher is the friend, Everything, everyone is a friend and that's, that's it. I think it's wrong. I think when you start doing that, you're not doing Budo anymore, you're doing a sport. Yeah, that's right. But just to, to finish the last yeah. thought, there will be moments that somehow you're going to hit and you're going to injure physically, spiritually, no matter how your colleague, your partner, and the, the only two you may rely, it's on a sincere apology. So saying sorry and trying not to repeat it again. So, and the opposite is also true, right? Whenever we have the situation of you can feel so that person today isn't having a good day so we have that obligation to let it go or trying to educate in a gentle way but uh, going back to your question uh, trying to uh, 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 change the the vertical relation of budo and uh, environment uh, in order to, I don't know, modernize maybe, or to... We, we have that in, in Super Gendai Budo. Yeah, it's, like, it seems like adapting it to some sort of modern, very modern ethic, um, like, like uh, what we see in another, in other um, parts of the society, where, yeah, uh, at school, uh, teachers should be uh, equal to the students, teachers shouldn't uh, uh, punish the students, the students should, uh, shouldn't specifically have a, a specific level of respect for the teachers, call, their, call them by their first names or stuff like that. Uh, we, we can see that in different various societies. And I think it's not that I, I'm, I want to be conservative, Maybe it's good in the society, I don't know, I really don't know. But in Budo, I think it's, Budo is here to teach people in some ways, uh, with, to, to give them the opportunity to emulate the society within the dojo and work with that, with physical movement and physical connections. If you make Budo um, disconnected from reality, I think it loses its purpose. Yeah, maybe it's a, a sign of the new times. Maybe. So Budo can survive in, in this new world. But uh, um, I see, uh, like in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu dojos, people listen to music during training, it's very friendly. And the sensei has the same authority that one, one sensei from traditional Budo would have. Mm. And I really depends on the, the community itself and how the, the top uh, uh, brings, uh, uh, shows its influence along the community. That makes all the changes. That, that makes all, all difference. So it's how the, the, the leader, the sensei behaves that is going to reflect along the students. Right, mm -hmm. we see that in, in different dojos as well. Many, many times, sensei doesn't uh, bring uh, so so nice input to the classes, and then you have different 
like uh, it's, in the end we are all people <laughs> yeah 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 right that's uh, as you said you know being gentle uh, it's not easy but as a teacher you have respons the responsibility to um, well, keep this vertical relationship with your students while being gentle which uh, and no disrespect intended with some teachers like what does it say uh, or other teachers the humble sometimes you can feel like you're slightly being abused during the technique which is probably to give you a lesson i mean it's it's not real abuse uh, uh, but if you um exaggerate that uh in some dojos where the the teacher is a male and the uh, women students there can be um, mentally abused uh, that story is we, we we hear about Budo so yes being gentle is probably much more difficult than just words and you can be gentle and also without losing the spirit yeah that's yeah. that's uh, a great achievement so in the beginning it is acceptable to be energetic in in a kind to rely on brutal force to perform the technique but once you walk the path and you evolve your technique to uh, uh, an upper level you should have a, a very light technique no matter the Buddha you're practicing okay so this week I was practicing and the partner, uh, I was practicing Aikido, and the partner was hitting hard. And the harder he hit me, the lighter I would grab him without losing the spirit, without losing the connection. And I would go light. When I say light, is really light. I would only touch his, his, his arm. I wouldn't do this. I would just, and I would let bang! And bang! And suddenly he, had, he, he realized that something was disconnected. So for me, one good thing of Aikido is to, to understand that cannot be um, energy or deficit of energy. If one of the poles has too much or the other has too little, there will be injury in one way. So I can do that because I have 20 years of practice, but you see many beginners without intention, without energy, just holding nothing. And then you cannot practice, right? Yeah. And then you cannot practice. But uh, uh, a response to a very vigorous attack is a good ukemi. So in the end, doing ukemi is a way to defend yourself. There are some things that uh, I still don't understand. So when it comes to the higher ranks, and I remember this time asking one Shihan to have a practice with him in the next class. And he simply, simply avoided me saying oh I'm sorry I'm too dangerous <laughs> it's like you are you have a post doctorate and you cannot communicate to lower people what's the reason for being there if you cannot communicate because in the end is we are well, dialoguing. Also especially in Aikido which I think is the art of communication Yes, right. So if you have a postdoctorate in communication and cannot <laughs> communicate, it's a little sad. Yes, and I, I was saddened by by that answer. Um, not because I wanted very much train with him, because I would like to train him like I, I would like to train with everyone. I, I like I, I have the the same uh, uh, happiness to train with a first day comer as the oldest guy in dojo. Like I remember in Libya, I was uh, at this dojo, like couldn't communicate that much in Arabic. And 
I, I didn't know how Dojo was working and I went to the last, I, I had show done already, so I wasn't on Hakama, but I went to the, the, the first place, to the first place of the tatami, right behind a, a little kid, on a bl uh, white belt. So we bow and I start training with him. He was like this. And I was in, in Swarivaza and doing some, some Kihon, some Tai Sabaki. And it took me like 20, 30 minutes to be accepted in the group. They, they didn't see me. They, they was like, I was training and it, I, I, I still have the, the video practicing with him. It's, uh, it was a, a very, very nice sensation that I still carry with me. And then when I finally could train uh, uh, with the whole group, there was this big guy, big guy, and he took uh, the most beautiful ukemi I ever saw from a guy with that height. He was like, I did a kotega eshi, and he, whoom! I said, that's beautiful. You see, that's the, the, the meaning of the thing. But the, the power of the community I could see the power of the community that we were talking before in these harsh days of the, the quarantine period the world has been facing and all the, the issues regarding the, the COVID-19. It was dreadful to see many of our friends that were, uh, uh, that leave, leave from Budo, couldn't be able to go to Dojo and to keep their activities mm. that they do for a living. Yeah. That was super, super sad. But at the same time, the whole community gave, and the whole world gave a new sense of use to internet that was so focused, so concentrated in entertainment. And from night to day, we had to adapt and use internet in a way to cooperate. Mm -hmm between us to find ways to keep the flame alive that this is this that, that fact shows the power of community mm -hmm. i think people are starting to get really really tired of that um, i'm afraid for the next few months the the second wave now in europe and it's really really getting in people's nerves and i hope it will end soon it's unlikely but i hope so because i see that people I even the the most um, refined human being human like budoka i know are starting to get really tired i think we were lucky in japan or really lucky yeah. um, we've never been really confined home uh, practice was stopped for a while uh, classes dojos were closed schools were closed also it was complicated with kids and many people got a, uh, went unemployed and of course it, it economically speaking where he probably almost as hard as the rest of the world but we haven't been confined home and that's yeah but don't don't underestimate the power of people to adjust themselves it's it's infinite and I'm pretty sure if we still have to struggle together, we will. That's what we're doing now. Yeah. Right? We're trying to, to keep the flame alive. We have a, a, a whole Olympic and Paralympic Games to, to happen next year in Japan with the whole countries. And we only can do that if we keep the, the same enthusiasm alive. And so the, the, the beautiful part of that was to see the, all the chain, all the movement that was created in order to uh, uh, give power to all kinds of people, not only Buddha related people, but uh, obviously I, I had like everyone, I lost friends to COVID. Uh, I had family with had COVID. Uh, so it's not easy. And living f far from your home country is... Well, especially Brazil, which was hit really hard. Yes, yes. And for me, not being able to go back to my country for the holidays and to hug my father, my mother, my brother, 
it's really, really complicated. Yeah, because even as, as an official uh, sent by uh, your government working in an embassy, you are still under the Japanese regulation that prevented you from uh, not leaving but going, coming back to Japan for uh, 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 months and which now imposes uh, 15 days quarantine. So is, is it the same for, uh, for you? The, so uh, we can leave the country. And, uh, but the point is, we, it, we're just too far from Japan. It's like 30 hours on an airplane, one or two connections in different yes, airports. Yes. At the time we reach in Brazil after two or three days, <laughs> we will be carrying so God knows what yeah. kind of And, and there are very, very uh, few connections at the moment. So it could take actually three days to find the right connections to... And then to stay 15 days in quarantine in Brazil, yeah. to come back to Japan, make the... the another the 15 trip, days. Another 15 days. So it, it's a risk we cannot take. But uh, I'm pretty sure that all the efforts that has been made, but you have kids, so you have you, you have had to, to just, do online classes. I just wanted to make the point that uh, even officials working in embassies are under the same international laws and they don't have uh, privileges that others have. I don't know for France or whatever, but in Japan, it's the case. I mean, we had the new French ambassador coming recently mm. And same, he has he had to do his two weeks quarantine when he yes, arrived. Yes, yes. Now they, uh, and uh, and they would enter in contact with us, monitor, make telephone contacts to to be sure that we are not leaving the quarantine. So there is no difference. There is no difference at all, and the risk is there. So staying in Japan is still the safest yeah. uh, uh, plan. Yeah. Well. Of course, I mean, France is a little closer. Uh, it would be one 12 hour flight, but uh, it's the same thing. Quarantine, quarantine, work, kid, school. I mean, it's, it's impossible to have one month of quarantine just to see your relatives in the world we, we live in, where we have to work, uh, take care of our families and everything. It's just impossible. And well, how, how did you, um, Take it, that situation. How, how did it, how, how affected were you by, by, by this situation? Yeah. I mean, you talked about your family, but here, work, um, um, no training for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, Kudo maybe. Not at all. No. So what happened is I, I had a, a self-quarantine period of about 80 days in home and having to find creative ways to keep up with my trainings. So I have this Makiwara net in my room where I can shoot from a shooting, uh, seated position, a lot of suburi, and um, I kept my, my Aikido classes with my, I have a, one student here in Tokyo, and we, we did few sessions, some sessions online as well, uh, keeping up the classes. And there were a few collective movements, so people uh, uh, adding up some kind of suburis every time. So we have this, this counting among the, the, the Katori Shintoryu group, and we are trying to, to reach, people are trying to reach one million, <laughs> one million <laughs> suburi makiuchis. Uh, people are still connected, and that's the, 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 the beauty of the internet, I believe. Yeah. We're lucky to have, I mean, internet can be for the worse or for the better, but uh, in the Budo community, I think it was really for the better. People really um, did lots of initiatives, projects, and people giving free classes online. And there was a few um, criticism at the beginning. I think it was from people who thought that it would be just two or three weeks and uh, we, we can refrain from going online for I, online Aikido for two, three weeks. And no, it's been six, seven, eight months. Uh, there is no criticism anymore. <laughs> Everyone say, okay, we have to practice online or just we can't practice at all. It was not just a few weeks. But I, I, I really think it was for the better in, uh, in the Budo community. Amazing uh, things happened. Uh, lots of um, also... Um, 
lectures uh, on Japanese history and Budo histories and Zoom lecture and stuff like that. Uh, Alex Bennett did a few amazing lectures uh, that were uh, with little animated uh, Bennett. Yeah, I, I thought it was amazing. I don't know who did that, but come on, he found someone with amazing uh, animation skills. It's really nice. Uh, for, for someone who was asking me like, a year ago, uh, what was the best mic to buy to make a video? <laughs> he just made a huge step forward in his, his production. It was amazing. And many people uh, shown a lot of our um, creativity yes. during this uh, pandemic. Well, I'm sure we all miss uh, the full blown dojo practice, of course. But yeah, I agree with you. It was, it was pretty great. Yeah, and we are adapting to this new moment. Like at Hombo Dojo, we had different moments. Nowadays, we are practicing with masks, and other dojos had to adjust the number of the practitioners inside. So there were some positive measures as well. well at least you do Kudo and Kenjutsu. So it gives you something you can still uh, hold on. When you do Aikido, you have to touch people, you know? Yes. Like ju Judo is the, the worst. Judo is still uh, stopped pretty much everywhere in Japan. Dojo is still closed. They don't want to restart in schools and they, they're so afraid that something happened. It's terrible for Judo. Aikido is getting a bit better. But Kenjitsu, mm -hmm. Kudo, it's, this, it's a dream. Uh, oh, or maybe Naginata and Yeri. <laughs> <laughs> are the, the, the best options for social distancing. The, the problem with Kudo is that usually we shoot on uh, uh, a tachi with five people. Yeah. And the distance between us should be like one and 20, one, 120 centimeters about. Yeah. But yeah, and some dojos are, are very small. So they had to... to adequate the number of practitioners every time. Yes, not all dojos are like a Meiji Jingu with the open practice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but Japan has lots of big places, uh, public uh, training places. Even the public dojos are quite huge. So um, I'm sorry, I'm failing in my duty to refill you water. Come on. Uh, the yeah, Japan has amazing facilities. So, at, at least for public facilities, private dojos are usually very small. And uh, the um, Katori part, uh, the the classes were uh, stopped for a while too. Yes, mostly during the um, the Kinkyuji Taisengen, yeah. the state of emergency. Uh, where is the dojo again? In Kawasaki. Kawasaki, yeah. Yes. Uh, you have in Kadori one in Kawasaki and one in Narita. <laughs> but the places are not aren't easy, easy to go to when you live in center Tokyo. Yeah. So, so I, I stayed 80 days under this self-isolation period. I might have left six times because we were alternating to, to do some essential jobs at the, the embassy. and But most of the time I was home all day and my wife Japanese working Japanese company she didn't have much of a break so at some point felt kind of nonsense she was still working and and she was very very worried about that but there was nothing we could do and that helped to to see how complicated things can be in the in the business area here in Japan yeah. and, and I, I can imagine the the relation for you as well might have big changes. Yeah, it was quite complicated. And I mean, I live uh, five minutes by bicycle from work. So I, I didn't do uh, self-isolation at home, but I did uh, self-isolation between home and work. Basically, I was working as usual, uh, a little less than usual because we had much less work to do, like minus maybe 50, 60 percent in activity at the time. So, yes, yeah, partial unemployment and everything. I have uh, I had to uh, 
account for the job that wasn't done by other people in partial unemployment and everything. So yeah, I was working, uh, but no, uh, uh, nothing uh, outside of home and work. For what? I don't know. Yeah, maybe two months, something like that. Uh, I, I don't remember. I don't really want to remember how long it was, but I think it was more than two months. And yeah, on, online for uh, all the basic uh, things, um, food, uh, groceries, um, masks when we could. We made masks for a while, actually, uh, because we, we need like DIY masks because we had a uh, um, few weeks period in Japan where it, it, it was difficult to find masks. Um, yeah, but it was pretty much uh, uh, a kind of self-confinement -con as well. It's, um, what can I say? I don't know. It didn't really um, impact my... Uh, mental health, I think. It was just uh, um, a moment for discovering a, a different way of life. How do you take care of your kids when they can't go to school uh, and you have to work? And yeah, things are really difficult. Um, it, it was an experience. I hope it won't happen again. <laughs> But uh, for a few weeks, months experience, I think I learned a lot from that. So following your state of mind, uh, keeps keeping things positive. Yes. I think uh, like you did, I learned a lot from, from that period. But come on, not again, please. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do our best so we cannot, we don't have to face something like that again and everything goes well in the next year. Yeah, yeah, we... We hope that. Um, and for those wondering, we're only three uh, people in the room. And the windows are open, and um, and we have uh, alcohol for disinfection and everything. But basically, if he has COVID, I'm going to have COVID tomorrow. So we're going to be careful for the next uh, week to come. Uh, but I think it's a very uh, good advice. It's just to, uh, if you cannot isolate yourself, just being um, conscious of what kind of people you have relations with, um, how close you are, how long, try to um, uh, evaluate the risks and then be careful in consequence uh, of the, the risk you took. Uh, as Budoka, I think it's a very Budo thing, you know, when you're on the mat, when you're training, you're assessing your opponent, you're assessing the environment, you're assessing the people around you. Why not keep this same state of mind uh, toward uh, this uh, terrible uh, pandemic? Here? Yeah, that's the kind of awareness we must have in all dimensions of our lives. That's the, the, one of the most important lessons we take from Budo. I think that, that's what Bennett calls uh, Zanshin, Zanshin, in, in yeah. a way. Yeah, it's uh, a full state of awareness, but in a relaxed way. That's the, the, the ultimate goal. <laughs> Be fully aware, but relaxed. The COVID is... Uh, finished yet, uh, but we had quite a lot of free time or kind of free time during uh, this period and lots of projects uh, happened. Uh, well, shamelessly on, on my end, lots of work to do, so not that many projects uh, except for this one, which I'm very happy to do. Uh, and no shooting for demonstration that we're cancelled and everything, so it's, it's a bit uh, complicated. But I've heard that many, many projects, and I've followed many projects, uh, including some of yours. Uh, so what's what's coming? What, what will you feed to uh, the Budo community so they can um, have uh, Budo in their mind uh, during the next weeks and months? 
which they probably won't be able to practice that much. Well, first of all, that's not the, the impression I have from your job here at Sado. I'm seeing you doing an amazing and wonderful job among social medias, promoting the, the kind of Budo we want to, to preserve and to deliver to the next generations. So congratulations again for yeah, that. Thank you. I wish we could have more projects uh, during these times because I know people are expecting uh, content. Uh, and it's very difficult to produce uh, meaningful content during uh, a pandemic in which we have limitations for production. Uh, but I'm happy for those very small talks because it's, I think it's really wonderful uh, content for, for Budoka. No, thank you very much for the opportunity again. And please visit YouTube channel of Sado Shop. They have a vast yeah, material so, so. with all kind of uh, Koryu and Butaikai presentations, Gendai Budo presentations, lectures. It's fundamental for any Budo lover like us. Please visit. Yeah, thank you. But on my on my end, um, due to the 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 self isolation periods and all the online projects that have been popping up uh, this year. Uh, I was lucky to, to have several chats online, um, either in Brazil or other countries, um, having this great opportunity to be here with you. I have translated a couple of books from Eric Shehan. He is an American living here in Tokyo and he has a, a very curious uh, a collection of um, old manuscripts, uh, Buddha related and uh, related to Japanese culture as well. Like the, he wrote a very nice book about uh, Japanese tattoo and its historical background. Mm -hmm. So we, we did the, the versions in Portuguese for the 12 Rules of Sword from Ito Itosai and the Fudoshin Miyoroku from Takuan Soho. And it was very nice that uh, Leonardo Sodré uh, our common friend, Arikido, yes. he had the chance to read both books and he made uh, some nice <laughs> remarks on both. A note, uh, follow him, follow uh, Leo on, yes. uh, on social medias and if you are, uh, uh, if you uh, understand his classes, because uh, I doubt he He's not teaching in English, uh, I don't think so. Yes, he's but, teaching mainly in Portuguese, yeah, but I think the closed captions uh, are generated. But you, you should follow this man. Uh, he's been practicing at Hombu Dojo for as long as I have, and probably longer. Uh, I don't know how old is he, but uh, we must be about the same, I think. But he, he, he's, he's amazing. When he's in Japan for training, he's training, 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 more, more training than anyone. I've ever met sure. uh, in 15 years at the Hombu Dojo. Sure. And he's not training just for training. He's training with the spirit and he's teaching with the spirit. So uh, really, uh, if you are confined, you speak Portuguese and you, you want classes, go see his classes. I think it's, it's the, 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 the absolute reference. Um, yes. If you want a connection with the Hombu Dojo especially, it's the absolute reference. He's a great source of inspiration. And at these difficult times, I can uh, guarantee that he has been a beacon for not only Aikido, but Budo community in Brazil. He has been teaching online all kind of matters, this, of all kind of subjects related to, to Budo, not only Aikido. And in, in such a, 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 a depth, that is uh, uh, very, 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 very uh, important to, to anyone. Even for, uh, even for if, even if you are not interested in Budo, you will find some classes related to Japanese philosophy. So please follow him. And uh, other projects. So. Yeah. Well, uh, for the the. Upcoming months, uh, I might be uh, releasing an article in one Aikido magazine uh, here in Japan. Uh, I also should be joining uh, a few podcasts. 
uh, Buddha related and non Buddha related. And for the future, uh, I plan to finish my book related on um, uh, adapted, adapted methods of teaching and training uh, for different disabilities. Okay. So it would be a kind of collection, either inside a book or many volumes, uh, showing examples of uh, teaching practices uh, for different kind of disabilities. So um, absence of limbs, um, people with visual impair impairment. So it might be uh, a good reference. Like adapted exercises and... Yes, ways of... Because many times uh, what I see from my experience is that uh, sensei, uh, the sensei, they are willing to teach, but sometimes they don't know how to approach. And obviously that depends a lot of patience from both parties, sensei, the student and the colleagues, mm. until someone is able to try, miss, improve. That happens to everyone, but in the case of people with disability, uh, the, the path might be, it depends a lot of creativity and cooperation. And the teacher can also uh, give up if he sees that he's not doing things right. So yeah, it would be probably a good help for teachers. To, Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, uh, send the links uh, or of anything you may have. So we can put that in the description of the video. So if people want to, uh, see what you've done, uh, what you're going to do, or dig further in the topics we talked about, just feel free to send all the links, uh, all the information you want, and we'll put everything in the, okay, the description. Thank you very much. Um, well, what would you um, recommend uh, to Budoka, any, any Budo, I mean, uh, really, um, to focus on during these tough times of pandemic? What would you, I mean, read Japanese philosophy or uh, physical training? Or what do you think could help the most? During the 80 days of self-isolation, uh, somehow I refer that period to the isolation that Takuan Soho imposed to Musashi, as in the, the as depicted in the book of Eiji Yoshikawa, which might or not be true. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not, but the point is. The yeah, point yeah. is, at that moment, I was facing, I, I had only my books, my walls, and few floors on my building. So, <laughs> I would literally every day wake up, take my breakfast, go up and down my stairs, come back to my home, do work, suburi, online classes, read. So I had to find a creative way to survive the confinement in a way that I could leave that moment stronger, healthier than before because we didn't know how long it would take. And I think that's how life works. If we wait, if we keep waiting for the perfect moment to start something or to improve something or to find uh, 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 the right moment to, do, to, to realize a dream, that moment actually might not come because the present is the right moment for that. And when I, I had that glimpse, I said, no, I, I must start now. I had like one week of a self-indulgent time. <laughs> uh, like my, my, my wife, she, she had a, a very, very strong, a very strong cold. So at that time, it was very difficult for people to get tested in Corona. It still, it, it still it is. But uh, uh, 
she had this very strong cold and once she she got better and i didn't had any symptoms uh, then i said no it's time to to move on how long is, is it going to take we don't know so actually your advice would be not to do this or that but to actually do what people thought they they wanted to do but never started keep, Just... keep moving keep moving no matter how small is your environment how small is the room you're living in you will find a way to leave that moment stronger that's the way so and among the projects uh, i also had the privilege to be feature featured in the kyudo nihon magazine which i'd like to give you yeah, one thank copy you. thank you very much um, um, is it the first time actually I get the, the cure? I knew about it, but it, the first time I actually have my hands on, on it. Uh, yes, they have. With pleasure. Uh, um, every year they, they release four editions, and I believe they might be uh, in the market for 14 years. And uh, on this edition, the 56th edition, I was interviewed by a good fellow Kyudoka, uh, Jessica Garrett. Uh, she has been doing an extraordinary uh, uh, work uh, promoting Kyudo and the Budo culture as well. And uh, along this um, Kyudo Nihon magazine, she has been interviewing uh, many uh, foreigners, Kyudoka. And also uh, she, she has a, a Kyudo club here in Tokyo, and they have a very nice uh, 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 article and some nice yeah. photos too. I think I'm gonna uh, read that later this week. Um, lots of, um, I mean, it's it's always a pleasure to see uh, that people are practicing Budo in. Um, uh, and this positive international attitude, I think. Uh, it, there, there was times it was more difficult. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really nice to see that it's getting... Uh, um, the international community is really blending I mean, with the, the, the Japanese Budo community. I think it's, it's good times to see that happening. Yeah, then again, back to the, the period of self-isolation, um, it was a real period of, of shugyo, right? And uh, uh, somehow the same uh, um, feeling that I had was shared by budoka of different modalities. And that has been uh, also uh, beautifully uh, uh, represented in a series called Shugyo, uh, made by Budoku and Yoshin Project, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm also part, and we have been uh, showing uh, our daily uh, uh, practice in home during the self-confinement, uh, uh, and all the, the creative and cooperative uh, measures we had to take in order to keep the flame alive. So this is uh, another project uh, that is uh, going on. That's, that's a, um, lots of things going on. Uh, and I think it's just the beginning. Yes. I mean, you're not planning to uh, leave Japan in time soon, I guess. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> work, Actually. work. <laughs> so my time in Japan is officially yeah. ended, <laughs> has officially oh. ended. <laughs> That's terrible. Well, because you had a, a like a five year. Uh, yes, uh, in my case, my my time window is five years. My time period is five years, which I've turned last July. Um, due to the current situation, all the the reposting process are uh, overdue. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, until the time comes, I will be doing my best, training as much as possible, keep 
working on my professional projects as well. I, I haven't mentioned that the embassy I'm uh, responsible for uh, education, educational and uh, sports cooperation subjects, which uh, I have been, uh, which I, I have the, the privilege to work for the past five years and have been doing some great actions, um, especially on the promotion of uh, um, uh, academic opportunities for Brazilians to come to Japan, for Japanese to go uh, to study in Brazil, um, uh, developing uh, projects towards the promotion of the Portuguese language in Japan, and also trying to, to share a little bit of our experience in the Olympic and the Paralympic Games in 2016 in Rio to the next edition of the Games. We do believe that the bridge that we have been building in the embassy between Brazil and Japan from Rio to Tokyo yeah, that's, that's... is going to be finally <laughs> finished. That, that was a beautiful opportunity, actually, working yes. here just in between the, the Rio and Tokyo Olympics. It's, it was a huge privilege. And I'm happy we had you before. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy, despite all the situation, uh, that you, you, you stayed. And so we could have uh, had you today. Uh, I hope that... Um, you stay as long as possible, but I also hope that the situation will get better uh, uh, quickly. Uh, I guess that it's uh, probably uh, also um, a condition to the situation in Brazil, so which doesn't seem to get that much better right now. But um, well, as long as you're here, we can work together. That's a good thing. And uh, once you you you're going back to Brazil, or you said you couldn't move. Well, uh, I don't know. It, I still don't know. There's the chance of going back to Brazil, be reposted to another country, and so only the Kamisama knows. <laughs> yeah, well, please try France. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It would be lots of good Aikido in France. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Oh, uh, you. It was uh, lovely to have you. Um, I'm. A shame that we haven't had uh, more time together since the first time we met at the Don Dreger seminar. Uh, that would have been, uh, I think, mutually beneficial to have more time. Now we have, so uh, let's meet again and have a few beers before uh, your time ends. And again, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, it was amazing to be here to meet the, the headquarters of Sado Shop. Yeah. Which small place, small you, place. No, you guys have been doing an amazing, amazing job, and uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of share this community with you all. And please always count on me to keep doing uh, projects together towards, uh, in order to to preserve the life of Buddha, which we strongly believe are so important for, for the development yeah. of the mankind, I would say. Yeah, a, a better world, more, more human, I would say. Yes. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, to everyone, I don't know yet uh, what will be the next interview, but we have um, two people we're talking with at the moment. Uh, which to uh, spoil you a little bit would be Guillaumera from Naikido and I told you and uh, Lucas, Lucas Kucharski I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly and I've known him for a while um, sorry uh, who is also Naikidoka and created a, a, a company in Japan which went from uh, uh, one uh, employee to dozens uh, in, in a very short amount of time and I really believe that uh, his uh, Aikido uh, mindset uh, helped him build something uh, that is also in some ways uh, building international bridges. 
no more spoiler. Uh, we'll have those two uh, amazing people soon. And, uh, and we have a few other uh, interviews probably coming. So this series, it's the third uh, episode. And certainly not the last. Um, see you soon for the next one. Thank you very much for the uh, for your time, which uh, could, should be about two hours. Um, see you soon, and good luck during those uh, difficult times. Mm -hmm.